Thank you, Anna Heike. Let me pull a little bit of water, and then we can get started. When Anna Heike asked me to speak here at CTEC, I was actually quite honored. I've not been to CTEC conferences for a while simply because I didn't have time, but I remember very well the days where I spent essentially my time at all of the CTEC conference, starting from the day I joined. Um, the speech is going most likely to be a little different to what you're used to, because I was asked to do it a little bit different as well, in order to, I think, point out some of the issues that we are facing. Maybe a little bit to my person. I come from a science background, as, as Anne Heike said, but since 2005, 6, I'm really working more at the policy level of the company. And with that, I deal with a very different kind of stakeholders most of the time. And that has, of course, changed a little bit the way I see some of our sites. So that's why I chose the title around innovation. And why did I do that? Because I'm convinced that without innovation, we are not solving the issues of today. And with the innovation of the past, we will not solve the issues of the future. So if we lose our focus on innovating, I think we lose the tools that we have in order to manage the environment in a way that benefits all, nature and society. That's why I chose that title. And let me start. What is that? It's not working. Sorry for that. There you go. So let me start with a quote. A quote of somebody that unfortunately already died, but he was one of my favorite authors, Michael Crichton. The reason I like him a lot is because he has been one of those that actually bridged very well between science, he was a medical doctor uh, by origin, and a more publicly receptible way of communicating some of the issues, also some of the benefits that this science can bring. Jurassic Park was all about gene editing and computers taking control. And nearly all of its books start working and dissecting some of the issues that we are discussing at CTEC conference till today, be it nanotechnology, biotechnology, or climate change. He also wrote one about that, the state of fear, for those that don't have read it. What he wrote here is, I think, something that should concern us all, because it's exactly what makes our science and the communication of, us, of our science so difficult. It is one of the greatest challenges of mankind that we're having is to actually distinguish between what is truth, what is untruth, how do we consult about scientific results, how do we move on? And while you're reading this carefully, because it will, at the end, I hope, summarize my presentation as well, I'd like to ask for a volunteer to help me on stage. You see, that sounds, come on, help me. <laughs> Thanks, you see. Stay here. You see, will help me bringing the need for innovation very close into this room. What you see in the background, and you see you can turn around and look yourself, <laughs> is a picture taken of weeding 
people in the field. They do this for hours. And because I always talk about the disconnect between agriculture and all of us, I would argue, I'd ask you see, to weed for us here on stage. <laughs> Choose one of the most comfortable positions you can think of, and please start weeding. They do it for hours. I will talk for half an hour. You should be easily doing that. <laughs> that should be no problem whatsoever. The interesting thing about this picture is it's not taken somewhere in the third world, as you would call it. It's taken in Europe. It's taken in one of the larger fields in Europe. And that's what I would call innovation. Everything that helps these people manage their land or help Yuri manage his land a little bit better is kind of innovation that we need. And with that, I will release you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It was a whole hour. <laughs> One of the tools that is used in agriculture is one of the most contested. And at CTAC, it is always a topic of many, many, many of the contributions that are made here at Syngenta. It's pesticides. Pesticides are extremely contested, in particular in Europe. We did this reputation survey or the survey of, 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 of what people think about pesticides this year. Oh, I think the last year, end of last year, I think we, we, we did the survey. And what it shows is that not everybody thinks that pesticides are totally useless. There is many parts of the world that actually think that the benefits of pesticides outweigh most likely the risks that come with them. But then there's Europe and in particular France, and apologies to all the French in the room. But there we have something that is driving most of the public debate as we know it in Europe. It's that we don't see the need for pesticides at all. And we're not willing as a society to accept a risk related to pesticides. That's fine. I'm not arguing against any of that. It's just something that we need to keep in mind because it will, at some point in time, most likely impact the way we can innovate around the sector. What concerned us even more is when we went into the so-called global opinion leaders. Those are the ones that are the Brussels branch, uh, Br Brussels located people or the London located people or the Berlin located people. So those people that are very close to policy making. And there's a clear view around those global opinion leaders that pesticides are not what we want. So let's dig a little deeper into what it means. And I will talk about agriculture because that's the sector I'm working in. But I'm pretty convinced what I'm saying here is also relevant to many of the other sectors. What has changed over the last 20, 30 years since I started in this industry? The innovation model around agriculture inputs, crop protection, has significantly changed. When I joined the industry, people looked at potency, people looked at cost eff efficiency. Yes, human and environmental safety was important, but we know much, much more now than we knew then. And maybe the spectrum, so the biological properties, were also taken very closely into account. So it was a much, much simpler scorecard. This is the scorecard we are using today. And as you can see, it has a much more balanced approach. This is how environmental toxicology and chemistry and all the inputs that this community has made to the decision-making process, that's how it has influenced 
the lead finding of new molecules in crop protection. And that doesn't come unaccounted because you can imagine that the more molecules are introduced with a much broader scorecard that the profile of these products changes. So the products that are introduced today are different to the ones that were introduced 20, 30 years ago. That's something to keep in mind because that's what innovation can do. If we stop doing that, we will stop replacing old chemistry with new chemistry or old chemistry with new biological solutions. Another important insight is the one of combination. I think nobody is developing today a product that will be used alone anymore. You will look for a combination, you will look for a broader spectrum in order to get a better combination and in order to meet the different needs from the farming needs all the way up to the value chain and consumer needs at the end. Because you have to produce food that is safe and with safe we don't mean only residues, we mean foodborne diseases as well. And you need to produce it in a way that at the end fits specific needs of the value chain. Another very important dimension that is coming more and more into play is the climate resilient respect, uh, perspective. More and more molecules and more and more plants are breeded now that are much more resistant against climate variation, temperature, water and others. And also the necessity to actually be much more efficient in the way nutrients are taken up is today part of the innovation principle. So this is how it is evolving as we speak. There is more technologies coming. And what I'm showing here is a so-called RNAi-based biocontrol. I'm not convinced yet that it will ever reach European markets. Why? Because we are contesting not only pesticides, we are also contesting everything to do that comes anywhere close to a gene. An RNAi, so messenger NRI inhibition, as we see here with the Colorado potato beetle happening, is produced using the modification of a microbe in order to produce that mRNAi, and then it's spread as a quasi-biological product. I'm not convinced Europe will swallow that. What is a shame? Because, because it's mRNAi, you can design it so specific that from an environmental toxicology point of view, so what we all have studied, or many of us have studied, I certainly did, it is exactly what we always wanted for. You know, target the pest, but don't target anything else. And that's something you can do with mRNAi inhibition. And it works, as you could see. But that's not the only thing. Also the conventional, if you want to call it like that, um, molecules have improved significantly over the years. This is an analysis done by the US Department of Agriculture, the, ecological, uh, the economic research section. And it shows essentially three key parameters that we all know how to study. Persistence, toxicology, and the application rate as a representation of the volume. And, by the way, because of the sprays and the energy consumed with the sprays, the energy consumption um, during that time as well that is impacted by that. And what you, oops. And what you can see is a steady decline of the rates, means that the products have become far, far more effective in the way they are brought out and in the way they actually work in the field. You can see a significant decline in toxicology, uh, in the toxicity, and you can use all sorts of measures for toxicity. What the authors choose is the inverse of the water quality threshold as an indication of human safety. So it's one indicator you can choose. I don't go debate it. It's just 
for the purpose of demonstrating what's happening. And you can see that on persistence, there was long not much happening, but in the last years, persistence has also been improved. Why is that? Because it's involved in the scorecard of developing a product. If a chemist designing a new molecule comes with a molecule with half-lives that are too long, it will most likely not make it. This is also a result of all the input that this society is giving to regulators all around the world on what should and what shouldn't be applied into the environment. So it's a credit to all of us that we see these kinds of trends. At the same time, it makes, of course, the development more and more expensive. And what you can see here is the amount of products that have been introduced since the 60s till today, per year. What you can see is that the so-called conventionals or the synthetic chemistry active ingredients have started to decrease in terms of bringing them to market. What you can also see is a pike, a peaking, a spike here of biological products at the beginning of the 90s that was actually constant and is now also starting to decline. It shows you that we are not talking just about synthetic chemistry as well. We're talking about biological solutions for crop protection as well. And that's something that the industry does as a whole. But what we're seeing here is not good news. <laughs> Because biology is always smarter than we. And we always will see some form of adaptation to the molecules, some form of resistance built up, some forms of actually not making the tools effective after a while. Means that the more or the less we actually introduce, the more difficult it will become to control some of the pests. And I'd like to show you how this looks in the European context. This is the amount of molecules available in the European Union today and, oops, again, and in 93 when we started to make this analysis. We had the introduction of the directive 91414 sometime in the 90s, and with that, we started to screen totally different for the molecules available. I would argue that is a good thing. And what you see here is the consequence of an ever stringer way of looking at it. So we have essentially halved the amount of active ingredients that are used in agriculture today. What you can also see is that in recent years, there was introduction of so-called new classes. Classes that are actually introduced in order to fulfill the requirements for the so-called more biological or organic ways of controlling pests in the field. Basic Active substances are essentially substances that occur in nature in one way or another, are just extracted and then applied to a crop. And the reason they were introduced is that those that want to have those molecules do not want to pass the same stringent registration procedures as we have for active chemicals that, that are designed to be like that. You can argue if that's good or bad, but that's what we have at this point in time in Europe. It also shows that you have a steady decline. And I want to go into the 440 that we have at the end, and in particular at the 267 that are still left as active chemical molecules in Europe today. I want to deep dive into those a little bit further. What we've also done is we have increased the rigor and the requirements to 
test those molecules. And this is an overview of the technical guidance documents that are at the moment either under discussion, under development, or even already partly implemented, provided by the EFSA in Europe. I'm showing this to illustrate two things. The first one is that depending on what end group or end point or, or class of organism you choose, you will always hit with this kind of guidance documents one of those active ingredient substances that is designed to actually control that class. If you have a non-target plants guidance document, herbicides will have a hard time to pass through that one because they're not that specific in most cases. If you have an insecticide and you have either a bee guidance document or an invertebrate guidance document or you name it, you will have a hard time to pass with this guidance document. What it means is that it will become extremely difficult based on these guidance documents to get anything registered in the near future if we follow this track. It also, and this is something that is very close to my heart, reminds me of the responsibility that we as a science community have in this context. Because we feel that this has not been done in true consultation with all stakeholders. This is done from a very technocratic and maybe academic point of view. But at the end, it needs to be implementable. It needs to be done in a way that is actually meaningful. And this is where we need to be very, very careful. And it reminds me to the days when CTEC was actually founded, and in particular CTEC Europe. We started with guidance document for aquatic risk assessment. That was one of the first projects that I was involved in when joining CTEC, in order to inform better decision making. I have the feeling we've lost that connection between us as a science community and the institutions that actually govern the pesticide environment. Why is this so important at this point in time? This shows you the trend and what really happened under the various directives. This is 91414 where we lost about two-thirds of the products. You can argue that was a good thing, as I said earlier. We saw f a few new introductions of active ingredients under 91414, and we had reapproved compounds. Then came Directive 1107, as it's called, 1107-209, and we can make a couple of observations. Since 1107 was introduced, we had 43 non-approvals. We have 25 that are still pending, that are ongoing and ongoing. And we have five that are now only authorized for restricted uses, typically in greenhouses, in a very contained environment. We had a couple of approvals, a total of 51 in the same time. But we have 216 that are up for review at this point in time. And if they have to pass those guidance documents that I just presented, the likelihood that this number becomes very, very small is very, very high. But we'll leave Europe without much crop protection at all. Maybe that is a political will, and maybe we shouldn't contest because it's certainly not bad for the European environment if we go down that track. But as a science community, we need to understand that all these decisions have unintended consequences that we as scientists should not shy away to mention as well. The first one comes from the agricultural policy itself. What you see here is policy at work. 
This is the trade balance of vegetable produce, so the green stuff, into Europe. So the trade balance is negative. So we import more, much, much more than we export. And this is the trade balance of the so-called foodstuffs, that is everything processed and meatstuffs and so on. This is, public, this is agricultural policy. There was a clear decision and it supports at the end the agriculture in Europe because we decided to buy cheap and sell high. That's what we did. You can argue nothing wrong with that. It helps the rural economies in Europe. But of course, if you try to think one step further and not just look at the value of import and export in this context, but think about what it actually means. It means that we're importing foodstuff, that we're importing hectares, that we're importing in order to feed animals that we partly export again. What we're doing when doing that is that we actually acquire another four and a half million hectare of land in order to produce for our feedstock. That's about twice the amount that is actually used today as food and fodder stuff in the EU. You can argue that's okay, but that also means that we're exporting the nitrogen footprint, the climate footprint, the biodiversity footprint, everything else that is associated with this agricultural production to other parts of the world. And I'm not showing this one because it shows that we're buying now more from the US and, and it's a reflection of the ongoing trade war between China and, 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 and the US. I'm showing it because now that we've decided or we were forced to buy more from the US than before, it doesn't mean that Brazil is producing less. Brazil has a boom because China is buying much, much more in Brazil at this point in time. So we can't associate ourselves from this footprint. That would be wrong. And that enlarges the responsibility of us as a science community, and it actually forces us to think not just about our science, but it forces us to think about the policies that this science informs. Because that has environmental consequences. Maybe not here, but there. And I'm not okay with that. That's not the only thing where it has consequences. Our attitude towards pesticides in general, but some of the iconic ones, and that's why I choose glyphosate here, are impacting at this point in time politics in a larger scale. And Macron learned it the hard way when he actually promised with an environmental minister that actually came from Greenpeace and forced him essentially to do this, um, when he promised to replace or get rid of glyphosate within French agriculture. That's the promise he made when he was elected. To his credit, and we know that the environmental minister is in the meanwhile gone because reality is kicking in at some point in time, but to Macron's credit, he is now seeing that he cannot replace it that easily and is willing to invest 71 million of tax payers' money to develop new solutions to replace glyphosate because that's what he promised. He created a special center, the glyphosate, the center, the resource de glyphosate. I didn't replace it, but uh, translate it. It is really from their website at this point in time. He created it and tasked them to actually come up with a plan and solutions and come up with engagement of all stakeholders necessary to come up with a glyphosate replacement. 
And I'd like to share with you the terms of reference that this group has actually evolved. What you see here, and it's again in French, that's why I'm going to just translate it. What you see at the top is the different agronomic um, solutions that, 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 or, or issues that, that need to be solved. So the various weeds that have to be controlled in the feed that glyphosate is controlling at this point in time. And what you see here is different means to control weeds. The first ones are chemical solutions or biological solutions, so substances that are close to an active ingredient. Then you have more me measures that, that come from the, the, the seed site, the, the, the production of seed sites, where you can do a lot if you do it right. Then comes a whole range of agronomic solutions like rotations, cover crops, what have you, labor, as, I, as poor Juzi had to do himself before. Um, all those, and at the end, some mechanical methods, all the way down to robots, most likely to actually control weeds. We've all read the dream of having drones lasering weeds out in the field and not needing herbicides anymore. That's what this is all encompassing. What you can see is that, unfortunately, the standard is very high. <laughs> and there's not one single solution at this point in time that comes anywhere near to glyphosate. And don't forget, glyphosate was actually assessed by European Food and Safety Authority to be safe for human and the environment. So we're not talking even a compound that EFSA considered to be difficult. It was just a political decision and a political molecule at the end. We have that these days. All I can say is good luck. It's probably not going to happen to actually replace this that easily. The one that is maybe the closest is a new herbicide class that needs to be invented still that might or might not come anywhere close to actually fulfilling that. I'm showing this to actually explain that there is an obligation of those that see these things to inform politicians as well. If we don't do it, we make very bad decisions. And we might actually do it in the interest of a single interest, of something that we consider very important, but we will not see the bigger picture and the consequences that it has. Macron said he will not replace glyphosate till he has an alternative, so he stepped back a little bit. But when will that be then? Will it ever come? I don't know. But that's not the only thing. I'd like to show one last point that, that is driving the debate a lot. And that's another stakeholder group, and that's the stakeholder group of media. This is from a recent um, Independence Post. It's in March this year. No, last year. It's from March last year, when the whole debate about the decline of birds and invertebrates in Europe actually was reaching its peak. And the kind of news, and we learned that on the Monday session, it is important to have a good headline. That's why the news actually look for this kind of headlines. But it shows something that is concerning me a lot, because what is really happening is that you have a shocking headline and reference to some form of science. It may be right, it may be wrong. There is no consensus view, that's for sure, on these kind of things. At the same time as this actually was published, there was in the UK as well a couple of publications that actually were linking the decline of birds in particular, but invertebrates as well, um, and arthropods to climate change, to the change in temperature, and with that, with different patterns. Other groups are looking at habitat and how the habitat has changed and why this is also impacting the availability of those. But it's much easier to just focus on one single 
issue, pick out the pesticide, and that's an easy news line. And that's why this works. It's partly in our responsibility because we like to be in the news as well with our findings. We should think every now and then if we are doing the full right thing with it and if we really look into the consequences. I picked this example because there is a real concern about the decline of species. And there's a real concern of decline of species because of climate change. And I'd like to show this study that was just also published in 2018 that looks at the rainforest in Costa Rica and invertebrate populations and bird populations in the canopy of the rainforest. And what you see, they studied over time the arthropod populations and the temperatures. These are walking sticks over time and temperature over time and so on and so on. Birds and amphibians over time. What you can see is that somewhere where pesticides are really not applied, you see a serious trend in the wrong direction. And it's most likely impacted through temperature. But this is not the only cause that might or might not have something. And I need to show this one too because it's close to my heart because I love dogs and I don't like cats. <laughs> this is the impact that domestic cats have on bird populations in the United States. As an estimate of the US Fish and Wildlife Service conducted in 17. This is a serious issue. And I know that cats have more than that because they also have an ecological footprint. WWF once published a study where they actually showed that an average cat in the Western world has a footprint equal to an average African citizen in terms of consumption of resources. And I know that in Switzerland, where I live, we have it some 1.5 million cats, at least. That brings me to the end of, of this, and, and, and really a call to action more than anything else. We need a new dialogue about science. We need to actually take what is on the CTEC website very, very serious, this is what CTEC stands for, to convene the science and to provide valued environmental regulators, scientists, managers with technical quality and comprehensive state of the science reviews. That's what we need. But we need more than that. We need more than that because we have to leverage that unique knowledge and that unique convening power that CTEC has in order to leverage this in order to influence and inform better policies by engaging consumer organizations, NGOs, and policymakers. If we don't do that, all our science will not be as effective as it could be. And we, the examples I showed just tell this story and, 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 and highlight the need to actually start moving in this direction because that's the only thing that I can see will benefit the nature and society at the same time without just looking at our single issue in one single place. And let me finish with one final quote. I started with a quote, I want to finish with a quote. And it's a pictorial quote that is essentially a big reflection of what innovation and stakeholder engagement around environmental issues can actually provide. And this is from the town that I live in. This is the Rhine River in the 1950s and today. In the 1950s, what you see there, and unfortunately it's black and white, is essentially a colored river. It was toxic. <laughs> All the way done. Thanks to environmental science and technology, the engagement of all the stakeholders and the investment into better technologies, we still have chemical productions 
along the Rhine River. But we can swim in the Rhine River, and I truly enjoy that. That's how good policies are actually implemented and how science is impacting good decision making. And with that, I come to the end and would like to thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Juan. Took a little longer. <laughs> thank you very much for um, expressing the, the charge that CTAC has. And um, in my fresh role as president of CTAC Europe, I hope to be able to um, work on your recommendation. And um, thank you very much. Now, one person in the room has the honor of asking a question. So make sure it's, a, it's the question. <laughs> Please. You put them so under pressure. Oh, I didn't mean to put you under pressure. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> well, I'd, I would one. actually like There's to... There's one. Oh, excellent. I don't know if, if this is the question, <laughs> but I have a question. Uh, you showed a slide. Uh, showing the reduction in pesticide application rate and the reduction in toxicity. So my question is, toxicity to what? Because pesticides are toxic by definition. Mm -hmm. if, if the application rate is reduced, this means that the effectiveness increases. So the toxic toxicity to something increase it. So if you are talking about uh, the toxicity to humans, probably uh, your, your, your data are, are, are right. But about the toxicity to the environment, I don't know. I'm not sure that this is right. Yeah, no, I, you're absolutely right in, in, in your comment. It's less a question than a comment. And I can only concur with that comment. The toxicity I showed is the one that was expressed as the water quality index. So it was the, the toxicity to humans. That, that's the, the, what, what they chose um, in order to demonstrate that. The toxicity to the environment can only be controlled, as I showed with the guidance documents, you know, through the minimization of exposure. And this is where application rates become quite important. Because application technology and all the other technologies that help to keep the molecule in the field where it is supposed to be and not outside of the field, those are the ones that can minimize the toxicity to the environment. This is a very important um, component of how products are designed and applied these days. Any other question? Uh, thank you very much for that really, like, really informative talk. Um, I really enjoy that also your shift of perspective, a perspective on, on certain issues. Um, it's also, again, more a comment on something that you mentioned earlier, that we are exporting our nitrogen input mainly. Um, I was wondering, because the way I also see it is, I think if the numbers are more or less correct, uh, the European Union is importing more than 30 million tons of soybean annually, and uh, like four-fifths of the world agriculture goes into livestock. Um, I think the amount of livestock that we harvest in, in Germany or in, in, like in the entire EU, we don't even have enough land space to basically feed all those animals. And we're importing the nitrogen, which is fixed in the plants, back to Europe, and it ends up in yeah, European soils, European ground. So um, my question right now would be, do you have personally think the, maybe the agenda towards a more sustainable environment is maybe hitting in the wrong direction by attacking the pesticides, or would you rather go for the livestock issue? I think it's not wrong to attack pesticides in principle because there are compounds that need to be very densely controlled. What is totally wrong is to focus solely on pesticides and ignore all the rest. That's my message because the rest is quite important and habitat in particular is quite important. 
And the way we actually implement environmental policies in Europe is not really looking at the habitats that we need to have in order to protect what we want to protect. If you want to protect the skylark, you have to do something in the middle of the field. Otherwise, you will not protect the skylark because you don't have a nesting ground for it. These kind of things are not influencing the policy making at this point in time. And I think we make it too easy by focusing on one single group of chemistry, I would argue, rather than looking at the broader picture. That's, I think, exactly, and I'm glad you took that message away, because that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've come to the end of the time available, so I'd like to thank you again, and I, I'm sure I speak for many of you um, when I say that the promise that your keynote held um, was fulfilled, and I really want to thank you. And we have a small token of our gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.